Okay. No, that's cool. Yeah, I'll just wait for him to get mic'd and then, uh, as soon as. Stable. Are the lights fine? They're not shining on anyone's eyes. Are you all good? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think Audrey has left uh, space there for you. Yeah. I imagine they're going to close the door before we start. Should we start? I think we're going to ring a bell or something. No, that's the lady at the door. I think she's just trying to see if there's um, any last minute people coming in. Yeah. No, I thought the whole bell thing was like. Mm, I'm not sure. Okay. But I will still end early. I'll end at a time. Can you take five minutes off? Okay, so we've started. Okay. I just need.
teaches at Georgetown University and is the co-author of award-winning The Next Africa. She earned her MBA from the Wharton School, of, uh, the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and an M MA from Georgetown University. Aubrey, over to you. Thank you so much and thank you all for uh, trooping through the weather to be with us at 9 a.m. Uh, it's my pleasure to be hosting this conversation today on the growth of African capital markets. Um, I think all of us who are investors in various ways, what, no matter the asset class, have to be concerned about capital markets because it's where exits comes from, it's from the dynamism of the economy overall, it allows companies to raise capital. And you know, for all too long, our conversations around capital markets have kind of focused on their small and, and illiquid nature generally across the continent. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing each panelist because we have a short amount of time for a robust conversation. So I think everyone can read the screen. You can see our esteemed panelists today. And Sean, I want to start with you. Uh, you've spent a career looking at capital markets. What kind of trends are you seeing in the space? Uh, I mean, it's interesting uh, in terms of just the, the growth over the last 10 years, in particular in the African capital markets. But I will caveat that. Uh, it is still very illiquid, no matter really where you look. Um, you know, uh, the developments we've seen is more of a concerted effort by governments themselves to um, really try to deepen their own capital markets, whether it be, um, you know, extending the yield curve, getting more local government bonds in the market, which is extremely important to risk assets, um, and just promote liquidity as a foundation of the market. Uh, also seen some campaigns around teaching to, to ultimately attract retail investors into the space. Uh, Botswana's done a good job there. Um, and you've also seen uh, initiatives around uh, secondary trading, so trying to get liquidity into the market. I mean, there's a, there's a multitude of things you need to do to, get, to improve liquidity. Uh, one is secondary trading, obviously. The other would be uh, additional securities on the market to yeah. provide uh, op optionality. But, but in that respect, uh, there's been some in interesting initiatives in terms of how to promote secondary trading, limiting the number of primary dealers so that uh, there had to be follow-on trades in the government bond market, for example. Uh, so yeah, there's some, been some, some positive trends. Um, we do see some headwinds in the market right now, so that'll be interesting to talk about, but I'll stop there. And Abba Bakr, have, how have you seen integration in the market space? I mean, for a long time we were talking about, especially in commodity markets, uh, there'll be integration between the different exchanges. Are we still seeing that? Hi, yes. Uh, I think in the integration perspective, we have some ongoing project right now. If I take the example, for example, of some stock exchange in West Africa, but also connected to the other stock exchange, we have some ongoing project that may take time and that can have, uh, I think, very good perspective. I explain why, because you talk about the liquidity of the market and so the fact that it's a small. And I think having this type of integration will allow to more finance development in the economy, but more also in the private sectors. Because I think right now, even in the small market that we see, for example, in West Africa, uh, the states and the government, they can access the financing with the market. But the problem is we need now to complete the financing scheme of offered by banking sectors with regulatory even Basel two and three coming. And I think this integration is something ongoing, but still we need uh, Wasn't there a plan to integrate on the East African commodity market at some point? Like the and did that ever happen? I mean I'm seeing some No, no why not? <laughs> No, I think there is some aspect in uh, that some part is a little bit political aspects. Uh, I think in the regulatory and the theory and the economic side, people are all agreed, but we are not yet there. And, and what are institutions like, um, I'm going to bring in um, <clears throat> the IFC and for I, like what are, what are institutions like the IFC do to help support capital market growth in the yes. region? Thanks, I think that's a great question. I think as the IFC, for us, the dead capital markets and the capital markets overall are super important. We've seen that um, following COVID, the COVID financial, the COVID crisis, that markets which are deep, vibrant, and liquid 
capital markets were more resilient towards um, that crisis. And as more and more crises come, we believe that we need to develop the capital markets. And we've done several, we've got several initiatives which we have in place. The first is really to lay the foundation for capital market development, and we call that the JCAP, which is the Joint Capital Markets Program, where we work with the World Bank and regulators to try and bring about regulatory reform to allow capital markets to thrive. The second thing which we are doing as IFC, and particularly in the team where I work as the, as the Treasury team, is what we call the Milken Institute. And what we do with that is we target mid-level professionals and try to bring them to IFC, train them, and equip them with the skills they need so that when they go back to their financial markets, they're able to develop the final, their, their capital markets in an impactful manner. So. Yeah, I've seen that program grow over time. I think they're in the third or fourth cohort now, maybe maybe even more. Yeah, yeah. And, and, go ahead. And we've actually, so we started in D.C., and now we've added uh, a, a new cohort for French-speaking. Yeah, French-speaking in Paris. In Paris? Yeah. So. Okay. So this, this program for all the audience um, brings like a network of capital markets professionals uh, to the U.S. Um, and now to Europe. Yeah. Uh, but what's been interesting is it, how much it's building the personal connections between the capital markets executives um, and looking for innovation across, across markets. Uh, I would just love to hear a little bit about Bank Trust's work in this space as well and how you see trends uh, unfolding. I think in, in Africa, in terms of trends, like you, you mentioned earlier, I think there is the idea of building and interlinking um, capital markets. Um, like he said, um, in theory, it's, it's there. I don't <laughs> think there has been um, as much political will to get it done. Um, I think over the last two years, there was the Africa um, linkage exchange um, and discussions around that. Um, I think it was Nigerian stock market, Nairobi, and Johannesburg as well. Again, it's, it's the political will. Um, on, on the actual stock exchange themselves, um, there's been some demutualization that's been taking place. Um, I think the most recent is probably the Nigerian um, stock market there. The idea is potential improvements in corporate governance mm -hmm. and incentivizing the development of those markets. But I think what we actually need is, is more diversification in some of the listings as well to attract in investors. Um, and for us, in terms of bank trust, we're more focused on the debt capital market side of things. Um, and we're trying to support companies in terms of um, connecting them with investors in, in Europe and the U.S. in terms of um, um, securing um, financing on, on the debt side of things. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll say that we're trying to support the markets in that sense, both sovereigns and, and corporates, but a lot still needs to be done from a governmental point of view as, as well. Yeah, I think it's becoming more competitive, right? So I want to bring Dimitri in look, looking at the, the emerging tech VC space. Um, you know, a lot of discussions are where exits are going to come from. And exits, you know, to the market and IPOs as a very traditional way in developed markets, but has not proven the dominant way yet in African markets. But many of the startups are looking and thinking about listing internationally. AIM, for example, or NYSC and not necessarily on their local markets. Um, so how do you see the interplay between the emerging tech sector and capital markets? Yeah, that's a difficult one. Let me, let me, let me start off by saying I think it's, um, it's great that Venture is featuring as part of an African capital market discussion. Yeah. It's such a nascent space. Um, and obviously the least underserved with respect to the more mature segments that my colleagues and uh, panelists are, are part of. So I think there's a huge role for Venture to play in stimulating you know, the next loan, the next bond, the next IPO. Um, the challenge we have with venture is obviously, you know, attracting allocators. Um, and, uh, you know, over a year in this space, so you know how difficult it is to raise capital for a, for a venture-orientated strategy, strategy in Africa. But ultimately, attracting allocators means, you know, demonstrating exit um, in any way, shape or form, whether that's through IPO or whether it's through the private markets. Um, but certainly, um, there will be a challenge with respect to, you know, listing and public market exits. I think the overall maturity of the venture landscape still needs to grow somewhat. Um, and I think that, um, you know, more private market exits, successful ones, will then attract the allocators and build the maturity of the market. Like the base so, stack one, uh, for example. 
Yeah, I mean, listen, if you look at the private equity on the continents, it existed for 25 years, more or less, as, a, as an asset class. And still, most of the exits are to private players. And yep. if you think venture is maybe being seven years old on the continent, something of this sort, um, I think you're going to see similar things. Though maybe there'll be some small listings, but mainly on foreign exchanges because these are companies that are trying to go uh, pan pan African, maybe pan emerging market, and local stock exchanges might not be the best Correct. avenue for them. Uh, plus, you have the global trend of, of people delisting, <laughs> and so for a while, you know, remember when Seplat um, co-listed, and you thought many uh, African companies would do that, uh, but it's turned out to be uh, quite the opposite from a global trend perspective. So. You know, but Bakar, how do you think about trends of, of corporates listing, um, dual listing? Yeah, I think uh, the trend for the corporate listing and dual listing, first we have uh, something uh, more attractive because in the corporate side, we have, let's say, uh, companies being more organized and also seeing the capital market as a veritable uh, real source of financing mm -hmm. on top of what the existing we get. Now, uh, the problem is in dual listing, it's not something I think uh, very often in the continent yet. Uh, there is some um, interest for companies, for rising financing, having dual listing into Africa or between Africa and, for example, London Stock Exchange yep. or something like that. But so far, we don't have yet very uh, big project or project coming enough to, uh, to attract this market. But definitely, just to finish on this, I think we need to uh, give all the advisory necessary, all the support necessary to drive the private sector going more in the capital markets. Because if you want to need or to finance all these needs in Africa, we cannot just rely on existing financing chain that we know. Yeah, and we've seen them used by the public yeah. sector, right? And we've seen African markets uh, accessing global capital markets yeah. more often. And and Mahina, I want to bring you into the conversation. Uh, part of this has to do with ratings and how African uh, entities are seen from a risk perspective. And so what trends have you seen? There's been a lot of concern about whether African countries or entities uh, kind of bear a, a, an Africa penalty, if you will, from the perspective of ratings agencies. So not to put you on the spot, but I can speak to that. Uh, 20 past nine and a bit of criticism on about the rating agencies, but <laughs> I can take it. So, like you say, our, our job is to opine on the risk of investing in Africa, uh, opine on the sovereign risk, corporates, banks, and so on. Um, so last year was very positive. Um, you know, African countries and issuers showed a remarkable resilience post-COVID, and that surprised a lot of investors. Um, and there was much more issuance, uh, more ratings, uh, but now we're seeing a different set of headwinds, global risks. And when global risks intensify, um, it affects Africa in, in multiple ways. So you've seen significant portfolio outflows. Uh, we've seen dollar strength, rates being hiked across Africa. So the next few quarters will be very difficult, I think. And but that's true globally. It's true globally, but when you look at the pace of rate hikes across the region, uh, don't get me wrong, African issuers are used to high interest rates, operating high, with high interest rates, but the pace of rate hikes, that's, that's a big concern, and how that affects households and businesses um, and inflation. Um, and potentially leading to slower growth. For sure. And the issues, you know, you still have a persistent financing gap for infrastructure uh, across the continent. That's why countries are often going to, to borrow on um, euro bonds and others is to pay for infrastructure. And I know we speak a lot about China's financing of infrastructure, but African governments as a whole are the largest financiers of mm -hmm. infrastructure. And so I want to bring uh, Sean and maybe others into the conversation of how large infrastructure projects, I'm thinking, for example, oil or gas developments that the, uh, can be co-listed on the, on the exchange or a portion of them that's government owned can be put on the exchange uh, so that you essentially have uh, individuals having a stake in these projects. Yeah, I mean, that, that 
uh, would be a uh, better to see. You know, you know I, I mean, I think at the end of the day, if you have the opportunity to list, call it a project bond or whatever uh, instrument that, that would be you know, conducive to the actual infrastructure project itself, um, the problem is, uh, oftentimes, the market itself just isn't really set up for uh, a security like that. I mean, you have very traditional plain vanilla securities, mm. equity and debt. Um, and in order to introduce something like a project bond, which sits in an SPV, um, is, is just kind of a leap that you need to make. And in order to do that, you really need to develop the market further. Um, However, you know, the, the upside to doing that, um, especially when you look at other um, countries investing in Africa that may not be in the best interest financially, uh, you know, capital markets provides a lot more transparency, corporate governance, um, visibility into uh, investors and the actual investment. And so uh, it stabilizes the economy overall. And if you don't mind just touching on the pension side of things, you know, there's been a lot of um, attention paid, especially by donors, to, to attract uh, pension investors into the infrastructure space. And that sounds good, you know, it sounds like- That means nice global, global institutions. Globally, I mean, even in the UK, which is a, actually a great example to use right now, um, considering what's happening with the pension system here, um, is there's been an effort in the UK and Africa and other countries to get pension money into infrastructure projects because there's a lot of it. The problem is, um, you know, you need asset allocation and diversity for a pension investor to actually consider getting into an illiquid investment like infrastructure. So it's like a nice talking point, but not really based in a lot of reality except for maybe a one-off if you don't have a developed capital market system. And in the UK alone, the duration available for asset pe pension asset managers to invest to match their liabilities isn't sufficient. And I'd say UK uh, government guilt market is, has the most duration of any developed yeah. country in the world. So, so they're faced with that challenge themselves in terms of liquidity and the dependency on, on diversifying in their capital markets before they even get into illiquid assets. So, so things like um, uh, infrastructure listing or, or issuing in the capital markets would be good, but you really need to focus across the board from VC to pension yeah. on the capital markets development itself mm -hmm. to actually get that investment to flow into to and, any of the spectrum. And Farai, you want to comment on infrastructure? Yeah. Um, Potentially I, green bonds as well. I mean, yeah, these yeah. things. I, I totally agree with Sean on the fact that um, coming up with project bonds is proving pretty challenging. And, but I think what we've also seen as IFC is that um, there are many ways to support infrastructure outside of just, you know, infrastructural bonds. And one of, the other, one of the main things we've been doing, like you mentioned, is green financing, bringing in green bonds. And as IFC, we've issued, I think, uh, more than 178 bonds and raised $10 billion worth of green financing. And we've done this in emerging markets as well, markets like Brazil, South Africa. But green bonds haven't been used that frequently in African markets yet. Yeah, but... Nigeria, and South Africa are the main, main uh, issuers. Yeah, definitely. And that's one of the main things which we're trying to do right now, doing advisory services to try and get markets equipped and ready for green financing. And another thing we've also seen is we're talking a lot about bringing African companies to the global capital market so that they can access financing. And what we tend to do as IFC is we support new issuers coming to markets because often when an African company is listing a bond, for example, on the London Stock Exchange, um, a lot of investors actually might know the company, but they don't support it as much, right? And you've got this issue you mentioned earlier to do with ratings and so on. So you have a marketing branding issue in addition. Yeah. So what we try and do is, as IFC, we try to anchor the investment and we allow um, the, the arranger to actually publish that we are participating in that investor investment. And with us comes 60 years of credibility of oh, investing of in emerging markets. And we hope that that gives um, other investors comfort to actually participate in but this. But that's partnership. the role of, of so many uh, African, well, IFC is global, but African entities as well, African Development Bank and others who use their ratings to, to help kind of build the markets. I want to take questions. So please, I'll take groups of questions. Um, but let me finish and just have any other comments on green bonds or the, the potential here. 
I am. Um, I just want to just talk on the energy um, side yeah. of things. I think what we'll see going forward, given the um, organization changes we've seen in some of the national oil companies. Yeah, so look some at, of the big chunk is listing on allowing individuals to have a stake exactly. in their own oil industry. Exactly. So you've, we've seen it in Angola with the national oil company there. Um, it's now moving towards a, a private entity with the potential of IPOing. Um, it's a similar case in Nigeria with the recent um, passage of the Petroleum Industry Act as well. Um, the national oil company is, is quote unquote, becoming a private institution. Um, and what that means as well is not just a potential IPO in the future, but the way in, in, t the way in which they raise financing as well. Um, a lot of the indigenous IOCs have, have struggled in terms of cash call arrears. Um, from the government uh, specifically because of the difficulties the government has faced in terms of generating revenue. Um, but what we can see going forward is that, the, well, it's no longer the national oil company, but the NNPC could actually go to the debt market to raise its own financing without having to rely on government revenues. Um, and that in itself could help to boost um, um, the debt markets locally. Um, and on the IPO side, I mean, you start to see um, greater diversity in terms of, of the companies listed there. Like you mentioned, Seplat is one of those um, indigenous oil and gas companies, but it's probably the only one um, investors look at when they look at Nigeria, maybe SSA, because... A part of that is the transparency that you get from co-listing. Like, co yeah, yeah, and I think even investors, when they look at Seplat, they probably look at Seplat from a London listing point of view, because there's, there's greater liquidity there and greater price um, discovery. But I mean, we hope with NNPC taking that decision and moving towards an IPO, hopefully on, on the Nigerian Stock Exchange, we can see greater interest locally. But that's still dependent on fiscal and monetary policy as well and an enabling environment. Um, if, if you know anything about Nigeria at the moment, monetary policy credibility is probably not at the, the highest level. Um, FX, is probably, FX policies are probably not the most credible. And that's really turned investors out from the equity side as well as the debt side, to, to be honest, as well, when it comes to local currency debt. Um, but again, we, we need an enabling environment in addition to some of these listings to support interest on, on the local capital market side. All right, we had a question here, and then I'll take a couple of those there. So let's go. Oh, we've got three right by each. So let's, okay, we'll go you first, then you, and then you. We'll take three at a time. Yep, go ahead. Tom Minnie from African Growth Partners. Yep. Um, part of developing capital markets is the um, domestic buy side and that hasn't come into this and it seems a bit of a disconnect if the buy side is all buying treasury bills and treasury bonds and completely absent from participating actively in the capital market. I was wondering, do you see any positive signs? So far the trend seems to be negative. Okay. Michael Mills from Bayes. Michael Mills from Bayes, uh, UK Business and Energy Department. We are the Centre for Climate Expertise. Uh, it's a climate finance question maybe starting with Farai, on green bonds. Um, as an ex-project financier, uh, we always get this incoming about, yes, we'll do the project and then we'll refinance in the capital markets, but they just haven't got there. Are we, and I'm speaking as now a UK civil servant responsible for climate finance, doing enough to help develop these capital markets? And I'm talking about donor capital that comes in at a concessionary level to help boost. I think South Africa excluded, uh, with that, that market probably functions yeah. on its own, but uh, for the rest, sub-Saharan. Okay, we have one here. Good morning, thank you for a great panel. So my name is Evelyn Jor, I am the Managing Director of Big Capital. We invest in SMEs in West Africa. I have a question for Mr. Mr. Jao. Uh, you emphasized the point about uh, the necessity of the private sector getting listed. Could you elaborate a little bit more about the obstacles? Um, we invest in SMEs, but we do not anticipate exiting, having businesses that would exit on the, on the public markets. Um, and I know in West Africa, the regional stock exchange uh, started a program for dedicated to SMEs, to large SMEs, but I think it's been years. Uh, could you also tell us a little bit more about that and uh, where you're at? Great. We have one more here in the yellow. We'll get this side of the room, and then we'll take this back. Yeah, thanks very much. My name is Constantine Kandier. I'm executive director for MIDA Advisors in East Africa. I'm also a trustee 
and uh, my question is actually more related to um, the need for investors to appreciate what pension trustees and uh, institutional investors generally look for. And with trustees, we particularly have an interest in ensuring that the investments we make um, have good returns, right, for our investors. So more important than all the other aspects, you could be having a good infrastructure project, you could be having a good project listed uh, on the capital markets, but in the end, why do we invest in treasury bills? It's obvious. We make money, good money. And so <laughs> we have to actually um, look at any other offers in, in relation um, to what we are getting in treasury bills and so on. And so the question you need to be asking yourselves as professionals is why are we being given a better offer you know, by governments and so on, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so I think that's the thing. Um, in Kenya, we have um, established what we call the Kenya Pension Fund Investment Consortium. I'm a uh, founder of that consortium. We founded it in 2017 to try and mobilize um, pension funds to invest in infrastructure. So I'm interested in that conversation um, going forward. All right, thank you. Thank you, so we had four kind of robust questions. Uh, first around domestic buy side. Who would like to jump in? Go uh, ahead. I'll, I'll take that. I mean, uh, the problem is the biggest issue in the domestic debt capital markets is the government. And as governments come under increasing pressure with global issues, and their finances come under increasing pressure, they're going to issue more. And the yields are going up and up. So it's, it's a, it's a no-brainer for a buy side to invest in short-dated, the best credit risk, uh, securities and that has a revenue benefit as a liquidity benefit as a capital benefit so how does the private sector compete with that <laughs> anyone else want to comment on this well I mean <laughs> I, I mean I agree and it's, it's not a real big debate there um, and it kind of feeds into your point on on pensions I mean Back to the, sorry to use the UK, I mean, if anyone's paying attention to the current capital yeah. market environment, it's been a S show. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, a wild ride. Um, and, and predominantly driven by, um, by the pension system. Actually, yeah. this morning, the, at least I saw an alert on the Wall Street Journal that the Bank of England's kicking in another um, emergency reserve mechanism to provide additional liquidity to pension system. Um, at the end of the day, though, if, sorry, I'm getting... No, 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 Weave in the question. We yeah, can come yeah. back to I mean, the, the, the pension, if the, if the pension system had enough treasury and duration to invest in, then it's doing its job. It's matching its liabilities with its, um, with its obligations. And so, uh, or its investments with its liabilities. So, I mean, you know, it, it's, a, it's a different animal. It goes back to the challenge of trying to get them to get into infrastructure. But at the end of the day, if there are additional options to invest in that have better yields, arguably a corporate bond would have a better yield than a government bond, it's, it's essentially how the capital markets works. Um, then there's more options, there's more return, there's asset allocation and diversification, right? On the buy side, same story. Uh, in, in, in order for the buy side to actually get invested in other securities, they need to actually be there. They need the list. <laughs> Um, and so uh, it kind of bleeds into then the donor concessionary capital side of things. In order to get those listings out, sometimes you need that sort of support, whether it be on the bond side through guarantees. Guarantees are a different animal. They actually have to make sense to the, the bond market um, or other concessionary capital. I know IFC provides support from an anchor investor role in corporate bond market. And when those issuance come out, they actually have demand typically if they're viable. Um, so they get sucked up fast and not traded. And so you don't see a lot of activity, but there's certainly buy-side demand there. Uh, you just need to see more securities listed. And in order to do that, oftentimes there's a business enabling environment issue that Io mentioned where you just don't have enough um, sec you know, security by the investor to participate in anything beyond the corporate bond market, whether it's collateral issues, uh, even just regulating how you get paid back on a default, things of that nature really need more uh, focus from all participating stakeholders in the market. Abu Bakr, do you want to come in on the West Africa and SMEs? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Joe. I think um, 
as she explained why that should be an important topic because uh, quickly for vaccines, I think in the last four or five years we arranged and structured, I think the biggest transaction more dedicated in the private sector, but also in terms of size, but not focused even if there is some ongoing pro in the SMEs. And SMEs right now constitute close to 80 to even more than 90, 90. and more in some countries, so which would be the real source of um, job uh, creation, growth. Uh, growth, poverty reduction, and all of this. And the capital market as it is right now, even in Africa, in different regions, is more addressing the government, the states, but Maybe also the, the Jumbo deal, yeah, yeah. 10 corporate mm -hmm. and the Jumbo deal uh, project. So right now, uh, for her, I think what's, what, what have been done and she's agreed is we have some uh, new instruments that came in the market, some based in securitizations, but some also based on some project, and I think we could discuss it after. In which markets? Uh, in West Africa. Yeah. And that could be also in terms of a basket bonds. So aggregating different SMEs, uh, there is some challenge, but allowing to gain size in order to reduce costs and also to access the market. And, but I think also for the SMEs, it's important to not just uh, uh, focus on the ECM side, but coming first on the debt side. So they have to begin yes. in plain vanilla debt. Yeah. So investors, they know them, they go the process of waiting, uh, and that will be easier even for them and for an equity story coming to be more prepared to just coming direct for an IPO, and even it's for SMEs, if we take into account, we are not talking about a big uh, market cap coming, you know. Yeah. So that's important to, uh, to to have this kind of pedagogy in this market. Anyone else on SMEs and capital market, Dimitri? Yeah, well, I just think, um, just going back to the pension fund question, um, I think the main challenge we all face is how do you stimulate this marketplace? How do you grow the marketplace? And that starts at the grassroots, as you can see in most of the other mature markets. Um, and for the majority of my investment career, I've had a lot of pension fund investors in my strategies. Um, and it's absolutely critical that we articulate how we can be that, you know, allocation of risk for a pension fund return to diversify your risk portfolio, but also to, you know, demonstrate why in Africa we can still provide risk premium and, you know, significant returns over and above the peer group. So it's an important space for us to try and educate the allocators and the pension funds that are investing in Africa and want exposure to Africa because without that support, without that allocation, we're not going to be, you know, the stimulator of the next IPO, of the next bond, of the next loan, which is so important to the whole marketplace. So it's how do you enable this whole marketplace to mature and that always starts at the grassroots. So we need to make more investments and raise more capital um, to stimulate that. So with our last few minutes here, I want to kind of go down the line and, and weave in the question on, um, on what can donor governments or what can partner governments do to help uh, develop the capital markets in, in Africa, um, and then also anything specifically for African governments to do. Um, so Abu Bakr, we'll start with you and we'll end okay. down the row. And yeah, we'll for wrap the it government, up. quickly, that will be more on the regulatory side. And, uh, so technical assistance for regulatory yes, reform? and monetary policies just to help funds uh, come in and out. More and then that delivery goes to, you know, if you were giving the technical assistance, it would be to the exchange or to, uh, tr to, to Treasury or to the Ministry of Treasury Finance? Treasury and fiscal aspects, I think, to help and enhance even the, um, the companies and give them some incentive to, to, to more come in this market and develop it by the way. And John, I mean, in any specific examples you can give of where it's gone well, that would be uh, useful. Yeah, I mean, so we're, we're actually supporting uh, the Ghanaian government right now. Uh, they've, they've established the Capital Markets Master Plan. Um, they're really making a concerted effort you know, organically to promote its capital markets. They have a GAX, uh, sorry, that's an SME, mm -hmm. uh, dedicated um, capital markets assisting system um, and and what what really needs to happen is a coordinated effort so they can't do it alone I mean they're mm. they're sophisticated enough they they have the initiative but the the, the it's a it's a multi-stakeholder effort so so technical assistance needs to go into 
to that working group, which cuts across the government. Um, but you are seeing progress, and I think you need ownership you know, first. You need buy-in by the government itself to want to promote its capital markets. And then you need donor support, both from a technical assistance perspective and occasionally to get the transactions into the market from a risk mitigation or a direct investment perspective. I know, and, and, and as we go to, I mean, will green finance and all the money that is going to be pushed in the focus help to stimulate some of this a little bit more, but I as well. Um, I think what the government could do is probably educate more on the benefits of, of being, having a presence on, on the capital market, so both on the equity and, and the debt side. I mean, when you speak to smaller institutions, they, they, they're quite hesitant in terms of listing on, for example, the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Um, I think aside from... Uh, monetary policy and stability there. Um, I think the government should probably lead by example for, uh, I, I would say that way. Um, privatization should probably be accelerated because you start to see um, benchmarks for what SMEs could be and what, uh, how they could be listed on, on the exchange. I take for example um, the Girigou power plant in Nigeria. Um, I think the privatization was done about 2010-ish. Um, the part owners of, of the power plant now listed on the Nigerian Stock Exchange, I think it was last week. Um, and I think that could be an example of what the government can do in terms of letting go, on some, letting go of some of these institutions, um, privatizing them and having them on exchange in terms of increasing diversity on the exchanges and setting that e example. Um, I, I think it's clear, you know, where's the weakest link in the development of capital markets in Africa? And it's the government. And you don't have to look at international capital markets to draw, you know, to get experience. Look at Morocco, look at South Africa, look at Egypt. Nigeria, um, look at Mauritius. It's a very amazing success story there. So it's the government, and the government needs to realise that economic development, for economic development, you need strong capital markets. Yes. So I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think on my side, I'll just um, speak to the donor capital question. And I think donor capital can play a very big role in green financing as a whole. I think there's so many different ways you can use donor capital for a, positive, for a positive impact. And to the extent that there's a lot of donor capital out there trying to drive this initiative, I think it's, it's more than welcome. We can use it to build frameworks. We can use it for risk mitigation. We can use it to reduce pricing and make it more affordable for companies to pursue green financing. So. I think to the extent that it's out there, it's always welcome. Dimitri, our last words here. Sure. So I think on the venture side, I mean, it's simple. We need, we need dollars. I think the more dollars that come in, um, the more enabling that will be for us to invest. Um, and I think that's almost, that starts with incentivizing you know, an, a whole array of stakeholders in the industry, so even with individuals. So you have amazing tax incentives you know, in the UK for inv you know, individuals to invest into UK yeah. startups. Um, Retail on, market. Know, and then the same, you know, the same in, more, in a lot, many of the more mature markets as well. So I think you need to stimulate the individuals, you need to stimulate the allocators, and you need to stimulate you know, the entrepreneurs um, to incentivize them to then you know, make Africa their home for, for founding new businesses. Well, certainly not an easy challenge, um, but hopefully working all together we can make progress. So thank you uh, for audience and engagement, and thank you to my panel for a robust conversation. Thank you. Thank you.